This is AutoLine This Week, the show that gets you inside the global automotive industry. AutoLine This Week partnered with the Consulate General of Canada in Detroit to produce this episode. And now, here is your host, John McElroy. Thanks for joining us on AutoLine This Week. Today, the topic is all about Volvo Car because they've actually got a pretty good story to talk about. And joining us for the conversation is Ander Gustafsson. He's the president and CEO of Volvo Car USA. Ander, great to have you back on the show. Thank you so much, John. Yeah, we've got a lot to talk about. And also joining us today are Sharon Carty, the editor-in-chief of Car and Driver, and Roman Mica, the publisher of the Fastlane Car. And Roman and Sharon, great to have the both of you here, too. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Well, Anders, what I would like to ask you about is the COVID pandemic has devastated the car market, but there are actually three car companies who have seen their sales go up recently, Jaguar Land Rover, Mazda, and Volvo. Over the last three months, you've actually been able to increase your sales despite this pandemic. My question is, how are you doing it? I would say it's a great network. The first answer is probably, you know, we have great products, but I would say I'm, I'm extremely proud of our over 280 dealers that have been fighting to keep the operation open. And then uh, major investments into, dig- into di- digitalization, and then make sure you have the, this, the great marketing and offers at the same time. So um, that's really the combination, but really the team. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sitting in my guest room in our house in, in New York, and uh, that is really how I've been running the, the operation now for five months, and it, it uh, works very, very well. Anders, you said recently that uh, the crisis is showing that there's a more urgent need for future technology. Can you explain a little bit what you were saying there? Yeah. Uh, some, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, and I would say maybe we are in the middle of the pandemic, but under the, in the beginning of when, you know, the, the deals, the dealers were closed down, I think everyone understood that we need to speed up a little bit to, to make sure that the customers feel safe. So uh, everyone is screaming for solutions. I don't think it's going to be, I call it the Heinz ketchup effect, that everything would change. But we see that the tools are so important because the customers, they would like to know more before they go to the dealer. So the closing ratio on our, on our deals is by far better than before. And that is based on that we have the tools, the customer knows that, that what they want, and the dealers, they can kind of uh, uh, utilize that at, to close the deals at the same time, give, give great service. So um, that's the current state, long run, uh, let's see. I think it's going back to some kind of a normal. I don't think that everything will be in line with how the customer flows are, are structured right now. But uh, I think we learn a lot. And our partners, they learn a lot how the customer behavior changed fast. Anders, uh, let me ask you this question. You know, pandemics have traditionally changed the trajectory of civilizations, right? And it's certainly changing the way that cars are being bought and sold. But is it also changing cars? You know, what do you see Volvo's like in five, 10 years, is, it, is this moment in time going to affect the kinds of Volvos we're looking at later in, um, you know, in the future? Yeah, um, I, I, um, that's a quite, uh, I would say, advanced question. But I, I, cycle plan changes is, is, a, is a big decision and it, it take, takes time. But I would say this kind of a situation is forcing us to do the sanity check and we need to prioritize because we cannot be all over the place because we need to shorten the time from decision to execution. So I think my beliefs in electrification, uh, if that was strong before, it's even stronger now because we have seen that the consumer can change their behavior very, very, very fast. Product wise, uh, and that is probably if I had some kind of a, spend more minutes on the first question here, that we can see that the customers, they really appreciate uh, technology based on safety. And, and we, of course, we know that, but it's very, very tough to sell safety with technology. It's easy to show it with safety belt and accidents and people that survive. But I would say the advanced technology that help us to be better drivers and also to compensate that we have drivers that is not as good as we think we are or they are, uh, that really putting a higher demand on that technology. And that is really what we are thinking about now. How can we explain so the customers use it and understand what is unique with Volvo. That is the changes. So electrification, technology around safety. 
Anders, I want to go back to the sales for a moment because every automaker is struggling to build back their inventory. It, it's actually continuing to go down for the industry as a whole. Your inventory is down as well. And that, that's a, another reason why I'm so impressed that you've been able to build up sales despite having lower inventory. How are you working around that? Or are customers just more understanding and they'll take whatever's on the lot? No, um, first of all, we took a decision uh, two years ago to reduce our specifications. You know, we were complicating the business by so many offers and, and we, you know, we always think we need to kind of a, have a menu that takes care of everything. And that was one of our kind of, I used to word trademarks when we started to turn around, a second turnaround wave in US that we need to simplify it. So we don't have as much dealer change, you know, dealers change cars with each other. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, they, they know what they can sell and it's not going to help to look somewhere else. They're focused on, on their inventory. And then it's also easier for us to distribute the cars where we see that we have more action. And I think the, it's very, very clear that the Southern region, they were really the locomotive in the beginning of the pandemic because they were not kind of um, the same situation like New York where I live. Uh, so we, by luck, culture, processes, that's probably a separate meeting to celebrate, but we were very, very fast to make sure we had a cars at the right place because we learned very, very fast that this is about if people feel safe, they will buy. And, and we follow that. So the KPIs that we put together, and I will not mention the KPIs because some of them are very, very cruel, but it was a combination of, of how many casualties, how many, yeah, those numbers really steer the way we distributed cars. Anders, um, what is the, the current crisis like? How does it impact your plans for Polestar? I mean, Polestar is a huge investment in money and also, you know, there's con changing consumer taste right now. We're not really sure where people are going to land with what kind of cars they want to drive and if they're going to have a greater appreciation for electric cars. So is any of this impacting how you take a look at the Polestar brand? No, I w wouldn't say. You know, the, when you execute the launch of a car, that is a decision that we took three years ago or two years ago. So I think based on the pandemic, I think focus on, on safety and our loved ones and what we think about the world and so on has probably changed a little bit. But I would say now in the beginning, based on the great PR and so on, it is it is a great car. And, and um, I would say we com probably compete with one uh, one competitor instead of, instead of, of, of 11, 12 in this early stage. So no, I wouldn't say I can. We cannot see it. I would be happy to give you the great pitch ever greatest pitch ever for it but th that is not the, the kind of a case it's the, the plan we have post are launched and then we're going to launch uh, one new bevs every year now so we change the whole portfolio uh, to 2025 based on platform and that's the strategy so let me ask you this what, what do you see as kind of the ideal product mix right i mean you know electrification is on a scale right starting with kind of a hybrid plug-in hybrid and all the way to electric vehicle. Where, where do you see the sweet spot in that for Volvo? Uh, is it all electric? Is it more on the hybrid or is it more in the plug-in hybrid or is it a mixture of all three? Mm -hmm. I would say, first of all, we see the high demand from, from SUVs. So we just start with the, with the top path. It's very, very clear, 80% of the volume is related to that. Uh, our strategies on, on, on electrification is that based on that people are, they like it. And if they try it, they love it but they are very nervous about the, the charging and range, range uh, situation. And so our kind of a strategy is that based on that, we have the highest, one of the highest loyalty in the industry. If we can move over our loyal customer into a PHEV, that you probably have seen that we have a very aggressive uh, marketing activity and also price positioning in our PFs. We see that as an investment because it's going to be easier and cheaper to take the customer from a PHEV to a BEV and take them from a combustion end to a BEV. Uh, so if they learn to accept uh, whatever difference in, in lease um, positioning on those cars, I think they will see that extra money that you need to pay for a BEV, that is well invested money. Because I don't know if you have enjoyed a, a PF, but you know, you, you, you really would like to do a better job. You would like to use it more, you would like to charge it more. Uh, and then I think that's be behavior 
we are trying to, to kind of uh, motivate. And that's the kind of a strategy. So the upcoming quarters, and I don't think it's a secret that we have a very, very aggressive PF launch in US. We are supposed to go from a single digit to double digit in a very, very short period. And um, I think it's going to fly. That's the kind of a feeling at least right now. Anders, what can you tell us about your first battery electric vehicle? And it's going to be an electric version of the XC40. When might we see it? How are you going to price it? What can you tell us right now? Mm -hmm. So, no, it, it's quite good to learn in life. Uh, so we have looked at our great competitors, some of them better than others to, to launch a, a BEV. Our conclusion is that we cannot do, we cannot launch this car at, in the same way. We cannot go for a major launch with a lot, a lot of volumes that we just push out and the early adapters, they buy the cars and then we produce even more and then they are parked outside dealers and then you have pressure on price. That is really what we can see. And, and it would be stupid and ridiculous to try to do the same once again, just because we are Volvo. We don't believe in that. XC40 is a very kind of a, it's a good segment. It's a, it's a car that is not, if I use the word expensive, because normally you go for the more, the bigger cars because you have a higher margin. We are doing the opposite. We go for our, if I use the word smallest car, uh, and it's a more kind of a, for a, a, a bigger group, not segment because that segment is big, but for Volvo, it's a little bit more space to work in. And I think that's the kind of a, approach. And don't kind of, um, when we distribute the volume over the globe, uh, sometimes it's good to have one big bang globally. Now we start with uh, Europe first. They have a different legislation, different view on CO2 and NOx and so on. And we, we kind of uh, launched the car there. They are closer to R&D. So if something is, is something is happening, we can fix it fast. And then we go, in, go to US, uh, higher demands. And this is a big country. Uh, and we need to launch it based on a zip code approach. So we will not give this car to a dealer that is not kind of a prepare or work in a region where it's a high demand for electrification. We will sell where we have demand and try to do a good job there and then take it in steps. So Inders, you um, recently announced that you're rebooting Care by Volvo, the um, subscription service. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the lessons that you've learned since it was launched in 2017? Oh, do you have two hours? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think we, uh, I have learned a lot. Uh, it has been, it's a kind of, a, when you see something that is so good, it's good for everyone. It's good for dealers, good for customers, it's good for us. And then it is tough to implement based on, I think, the biggest worry I have about the US market is that we are very afraid of change. And that is very common all over the world, but based on the system here, and that is probably based on trust. And I don't think the trust is related to me. I think really my, my dealers that I really, really appreciate, they trust me. Uh, but this is a different approach. So it takes time. And, and uh, we did something stupid in the beginning, and I, it's just to admit it, uh, we launched Keba Volvo with X40, and X40 was such a success, so it was sold out in a very short period. And as you know, when you launch a car in US, the first golden months is the golden months of margins. And of course, when you in kind of a launch this kind of activity, and you chip on the toes of, of freedom and franchise laws and so on, uh, you can kind of uh, misread and try to read between the lines that you shouldn't do. And that is really what I've been working with. Uh, it's much, much better. Uh, I think the problem is related to one unique state. And the issue there that is solved is not related to Volvo and my and our partners. It's related to that the industry, they are afraid of change. It's not the Volvo dealers. They are not afraid of change. It's just that this is kind of a, if you don't trust, you can see this as a Trojan horse, and, and that is what we have been discussing in a lot, a lot of meetings, and that is the number one question in every interview for three years. Uh, so I am more kind of a, can we just leave it and just enjoy it? Uh, that's my feeling, but I, I have promised the partners I will show a great respect for this. Uh, if it takes time, it will take time, that's okay. Uh, and we are the first, there's no one to learn from. Uh, all the negotiation in every separate state that we need to do, it takes a lot of time. 
And it's, can I ask you this? You know, um, I'm in Colorado, right? And we, I can't help but notice that like lifestyle vehicles and off-roaders are having a moment right now. You know, with the introduction of the new Bronco, with Wrangler selling, gosh, one month, I think it's old, 20 some thousand units. That's a Wrangler a, a month. I mean, that, that's a lot of Jeeps for a vehicle that's a highly specialized, dedicated off-roader. Now, Volvo came out with the cross country uh, and basically it, it you know it took a station wagon and, and made it a little bit more lifestyle a little bit more off-road worthy uh, at the same time the kind of subaru did that with the outback uh but have you given some thought to actually putting a little bit more kind of off-road cred into the cross country lineup so it's not just you know cladding and a little bit of height but actually has a little bit more overlandy kind of off-roady ability to it uh, and I, I see that where that's where it's going here in America. I'm not sure that's where it's going in Europe, you know, much different um, country. But have you given that some thought to making a little bit more, you know, more off-road worthy as opposed to making it more urban with kind of off-road cladding, but not necessarily the off-road credentials that a lot of serious off-roaders have? You know, my, my, I'm, I'm Swedish and my reputation is that I always say exactly how it is because then I can be much faster. So the answer is no. Um, and, and, and I, of course, I, I see the segments. I see one thing that has very, very impressed of it. That is the residual value development in those segments. So one part of me, yes, but you know, we have a, a, a we need to move this brand to a price positioning so we can pay our bills and we can invest in technology in our new cars. And, and to do that, you cannot be everywhere. Uh, you need to be focused. And, and that is what we are kind of, uh, we are doing. And, and that's the product line that the dealers that have seen. The XC90 and XC60 and XC40, 80% of our volume, 84, I think. And it is uh, profitable for us, profitable for dealers, and also profitable for customers because it's a great residual value. So I, I think we're on the right track. And um, I don't want to put um, uh, additional split vision views on the strategies that we work with right now. So I am not putting those demands on, on the development center right now. Anders, I want to follow up on Sharon's question. Go back to the subscription service, Care by Volvo. Uh, when we last had you on the show, it was about a year and a half ago, I was asking you, what are you going to do with the cars that come back? Because some subscription people can bring them back after only one year. I, I think you said at the, the, the time, the, the idea was to put them in the used car lot. So question number one, is that happening? Yeah. And it's what so happens with the people who tried Care by Volvo? Do they sign up for another car or do you lose them? What's going on there? Yeah. First of all, I would say it was a good in interview and I was very, very lucky because the, the, the current residual value on a Volvo is on the highest level in many, many years. Uh, and right now, everyone know is a lack of used cars. And there you have the combination of the residuals. So I was quite lucky when I answered that question that that will not be a problem because it, it's not a problem. Uh, I think based on used cars, you need to have a, a stock or I, I call use the word a refrigerator where you have one year, two year and three year. And the one year cannot just be rentals, uh, loaners and demos. It needs to be uh, a mileage on those cars that goes in line with, with a, a private consumer and so on. So. I would say it works. Uh, your second question about the loyalty. You know, if you remember, we said that around 80, close to 90% of the consumers that went into subscription, they were coming from other brands. But that was also related to that XC40 was brand new. So it was two answers on that question. So now when the car is getting into year, year three, we see that that kind of leverage off a little bit, but at the same time, it is new customers that is coming in through Keba Volvo. And they, some of them don't change after 12 months because they love their car and they don't want to move over things and so on. So I wouldn't say that the risk calculations that we did, if it was a shorter uh, agreement, because that's it's less profitable, um, you can, of course, make money because you sell one more car and you go into that spiral of, of, of volume. We cannot see that. Customers to stay in the cars, the majority of them, and then we can use the kind of a Keba Volvo customers as a refrigerator if I would like to pull in more used cars into our revenue stream. Dealers make more money, we make more money, and we sell a new one. That was the dream with Keba Volvo. So it works. Uh, but we, the volume needs to go up 
and the dealers, I would say, and the system needs to trust subscription because it works and it's good for everyone. And there's a lot of the rest of, well, some other automakers are moving um, just completely away from sedans and cars. And you guys have a healthy SUV crossover um, model lineup, but what do you think the future for the S60 and the S90 are? Uh, it was good that you put uh, the other question, you know, between the, the, the Jeep discussion and so on. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's when we, I really hope that you, you agree on that we had transferred this brand to something else in a very short period. We have had a growth of 100%. Uh, we have totally changed the customer's view on our products and we can charge more than ever for our products. So our profitability is better and our dealers are also getting, they earn more money. To, to attract new customers to our brand, because I said 50% 50, 50 loyalty or over that is very good, but they are very price sensitive. Uh, so you need to attract new customers into the brand. Therefore, the S60 is the entry level car if you uh, have learned you should never talk about h in us but if you attract all our marketing is always towards 30 or whatever but it's always 50 plus that buys the car but we can see on the s60 that it's a little bit different uh, and those customers we need to get into our brand because it's cheaper to convert them from s60 to x60 or x90 uh, it's much easier same strategy that we have with pfs to bevs and so on let them into our fabulous family. Hopefully we can take care of them so they stay and then we can work with lease payments and so on in the family. Long answer on your question, but it, it is a good question. Maybe sense. we should should stop with, with sedans and so on, but I don't think so. That is not our strategy. Segment is down 23. Uh, we are on eight, nine. If you put Tesla into that segment, uh, we are around four four point two, I think. And, and um, there you have one of the other answers that Tesla mess around with the segments. And I think that is fun because that gives us energy to implement our strategy even faster with electrification. You know, the uh, Volvo wagon is iconic. And as an automotive journalist, I love wagons, uh, but uh, oh my, they're not having a moment right now. You know, people are not uh, into wagons. Um, What's your commitment to the wagon? Will we see, uh, you know, follow up on the question, will we see a Volvo wagon 10 years from now, 20 years from now? You know, I'm a Swede, uh, so, so I'm the wrong person to ask. <laughs> uh, I really I have a 18-year-old son that I really love, but he's the chairman of Hell Drivers, and, and, and uh, I, I, he is driving a V60 country and he cannot cherry pick i decide cars uh, and i gave him kind of a smaller engine and he hates me for that <laughs> uh, but i would say his trademark in the city where we live that he's a swede and he is driving a v60 cross country uh, i think uh, if you ask he's proud uh, it is a beautiful car you can use it for so many more things and if you just spec it in a good way it, it, it is a winner but it is tough in us i would say and that is related to suv uh, and that it's, you know, easier to go into that. And I would say uh, we don't have excuse on residual values because that is very, very good on our, our wagons. It's very, very, very good. So really, we don't have any reasons, you know, it should sell really. Um, but the interest is not there. So we are taking our share and we are uh, utilizing the interest for, 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 from those customers. That is very, very loyal. They, we have a higher loyalty on, on wagons than anything else it's really higher than plus 50. Yeah, I, I think every automotive journalist loves wagons. I do too, but they, they they just don't sell that well in the U.S. market. But I'd like to ask you about the S60. Uh, Volvo now has an assembly plant in the United States. My understanding is that 100% of the S60 production was going to come from that plant. But I see that uh, your sales in the U.S. from that plant for the S60 are actually down and you're importing more of them. I, I, I think it's from Belgium. Is that because of COVID production or did something go wrong in the plans here? No, it's, really, it's two answers. First, divide it into tariffs. Uh, when the tariffs were implemented, um, it was painful months because that was really XC60 that we imported to um, to US and we were supposed to export S60. So it should be one for one. 
that was the kind of a strategy with, with the plant. The tariffs uh, messed up with that. So now we cannot export S60, S60 to China. We, S60, we export it from, from US to Europe. So all uh, US or Americas slash European uh, S60s are coming from our plant in Charleston. And China, they build their own S60 in, in their, their operation. So, and, and of course, um, if you ask me or, or, or Helkan, our global CEO, about the decision on a sedan, you know, we didn't know uh, about tariffs when we took that decision. Uh, the sedan segment is down 20%, but we are delivering eight. And also the plant is kind of a, into a practice and preparation for the launch of the XC90, that is our flagship. And that car will totally turn around the volumes in Charleston to one of our bigger plants in the world. So, and also one of the more advanced plants in the world. So give us two more years, then you're going to see even more XC90s coming from Charleston. Real good. Anders, we're going to have to wrap this up right now. Thank you so much for your time again. Thank you for your candor as well. That's much appreciated. Thank you. And Roman and Sharon, great to have the both of you on the show as well. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks, Ben. And as I always say, I want to thank all of you for having tuned in. AutoLine This Week partnered with the Consulate General of Canada in Detroit to produce this episode.